I think we would be shocked at how different everything is from what we expect it to be. We don't have something we can call the Bible until around the 4th century CE. So like after Nicaea is when we first bring things together into a single text. And so everything before that is, is separate documents that they could be grouped together and they could circulate as a group, but that grouping could be different from time to time and from place to place. Uh, and so for the Hebrew Bible, that's being written between around 1000, maybe a little earlier than 1000 BCE, all the way down to about 165 BCE. It's probably the earliest to the latest uh, layers of the text in there. And some of it is very early poetry uh, being written by community leaders. Some of it is uh, legal texts that are being written by cultic and uh, state authorities. Some of it is uh, prophetic material being written by prophets. A lot of it is narrative, historical narrative that's being written again by cultic and state authorities in order to try to produce kind of a foundation myth about where we came from that helps them um, kind of curate their own nation of what the notion of what the state is. Uh, and so that comes together in a complex way. People are adding to it. People are putting text together. People are editing the text. Some of those texts are dropping off. Some of those new texts are being added later. And around by around the end of the first century CE, so around the time the New Testament is being composed, the Hebrew Bible as we understand it today was more or less settled. The New Testament is uh, the earliest texts we have are the uh, writings of Paul, and not all of the Pauline epistles were written by Paul. Some of them were written decades after his death, but the earliest texts are First Thessalonians, uh, Romans, things like that. And uh, we have the Gospels being written after that. We have other texts being written after that. We probably have texts of the New Testament being composed into maybe getting close to 150 CE. So in the second century, we still have some texts being composed. And then there are other texts that are being composed by other writers in the second century, uh, particularly Gnostic authors, that are kind of presenting an alternative perspective on, on the Christian Gospel. Uh, and we start to see debates about which of these texts are authoritative, which are not in the second century and then to the third century. And around the fourth century is when we see uh, that debate kind of settling down and deciding on what's going to be in. And it's around the end of the fourth century that we finally have uh, the first kind of authoritative declaration of what's going to be in the Bible that more or less matches what we have today. Do we know why certain things were included and why certain things were left out? The, so the idea that there were specific questions and specific criteria that determined what were in or out are actually kind of post hoc rationalizations. The driving factor was which texts were in the most widespread use within Christian congregations around Christendom. Uh, and a lot of that had to do with these debates about, well, is this, does this, is this consistent with this? Is this likely authentic or is this not authentic? So I, I mentioned First Enoch. That was something that early Christian authors were like, hey, this is really influential. However, it seems very unlikely that this text survived from before the flood. And it contradicts itself internally, and then it also contradicts some of the stuff we've got going on in the Gospels and elsewhere. And so that kind of fell out of favor because it couldn't really hang in, in those debates, and communities just stopped using it. And so what happens in the 3rd and the 4th centuries is you have Christian leaders going around and basically polling all the congregations to try to figure out what texts are considered authoritative and are allowed to be read in our meetings and, and are considered uh, divinely inspired. And then when that kind of started firming up, that's when you had people saying, okay, well, let's identify what is shared between all these texts. Oh, they all have apostolic origins, or at least are based on apostolic authority, or, oh, they all affirm this doctrine or something like that. Most of that was a later rationalization, and it was really uh, what was most in most widespread use that was the driving factor in the canonization, at least of the New Testament. I guess the way that I always think about it, right, and my imagination fills in all of the gaps, is I just imagine like there's 
10 guys in a room at the council of Nicaea and they're like, all right, copy this part, put it over here, like copy <laughs> and paste. Like that's, Hey, this way, let's, let's leave that part out. Right. Like that's <laughs> the, but that doesn't sound like that's really how it happened necessarily. Now that's a, that's a popular idea about how it happened. And one of the reasons is because that serves a lot of structuring of power today. If we can frame what went on with the canonization of the Bible as basically an executive meeting that we might imagine taking place within some corporation today, then that allows us to kind of, it, to some degree, vilify what was going on and say we can, you know, their their decisions were obviously corrupt. But that it's not really an accurate uh, depiction of what went on. It was mainly Christian communities using these texts and people going around and saying, okay, well, it seems like these are the texts that most everybody's using. And then the councils basically said, approved. And so um, apart from the leadership condemning certain authors and certain texts as heretical, and that was mainly the Gnostic literature, but there were other uh, other texts as well. Apart from, from that uh, kind of explicit condemnation of those texts, everything else was, was just what was most popular. Can we tell going back if it was supposed to be something that was followed to the letter or if it was always kind of more of, you get the idea kind of a, a book. Yeah, I I think for the Hebrew Bible, it was largely a you get the idea. And a lot of these texts were written uh, to be circulated within closed circles, like within the authoritative groups. Uh, and they probably weren't widely known, like the Torah was probably not widely known and widely followed until around the second or the first century BCE, which is, so the whole Hebrew Bible has been written by this period. And texts were still not functioning the way they function today. At that time period, the kind of locus of authority was not in the text, but in the idea. And the text was just one iteration of it. It was just one version of it that has been materialized. And it's kind of the opposite today. We place the authority in the physical text itself, uh, and the idea that's behind it does not carry the same weight because that is malleable, that is manipulable, that is changeable, whereas the text is the text and it's not changing. So there has been a shift in where we place the authority between around the New Testament and today, and I, and I think the, the Renaissance, the Reformation, and the Enlightenment uh, kind of played a significant role in the way we... Uh, look at the authority of text today and thinking about the letter of the text rather than the spirit. But yeah, I would say for most of the Bible, it was really the spirit more than the letter. What are the What are the chances we got this all wrong? <laughs> um, hi. Uh, I think there, if we, if time travel became a reality and we were able to go back into this uh, into the world of the composition of the Hebrew Bible or the world of the composition of the New Testament, and we were able to learn the language and communicate, I think we would be shocked at how different everything is from what we expect it to be. For the stuff that we kind of get wrong in that aspect, is it big differences in the sense that like, okay, well, they said one and we interpreted it as 10 or they said six and we thought it was 6.5. Like, are we making big mistakes or just kind of like ah, six of one, half a dozen <laughs> of the other kind of mistakes? I think there are examples of both. And I think it, there is more of an incentive to be further off and to be okay with being further off. The more useful a text is for uh, a given purpose that that we wanted to serve and so a lot of the hot button issues i think people are frequently far more off on uh, by orders of magnitude for instance things that have to do with the lgbtq plus community things that have to do with abortion things that have to do with slavery things that have to do with uh, the subjugation of women these are these are things where people want certain ideologies to be present and so they're more willing to to be far away subconsciously. They're not knowingly being far away, but that's where I think the utility of the text pushes us further away from what was originally intended. And so I think 
the more prominent a text is in debates going on today, the more likely we are pretty far off from, from what it probably originally meant.